Okay, I'm here to welcome you to Chicago Kent's, uh, the first half of Chicago Kent's Constitution Day celebration. We're actually doing a Constitution Week uh, this year, and this will be uh, part one. So today we're going to be talking about the press, the Supreme Court, and the Constitution, and I'm thrilled to have uh, our three guests here in town to join us for the discussion. Um, but I'm going to hold off introducing them before, uh, first I want to offer some thank yous. First, thank you to Dean Krent, who helped make this possible. He was unable to be here today, but he was instrumental in getting this going, as well as the Jack Miller Center, who helped sponsor this event. And the Jack Miller Center has some pocket constitution, so grab one on the way out. Uh, always have a constitution in your pocket. I see some constitutional law students out there, okay? We know, always in your pocket. Never, never be there without one. Um, so those are there for you. Um, other events that we have going on this week. On Wednesday, Professor Heyman is going to give a lecture on the conservative libertarianism and transformation of First Amendment jurisprudence. This is at 3 o'clock on Wednesday, so this will be part two of our Constitution Day uh, celebration. This is, in fact, on Constitution Day, September 17th. And that will be up in room uh, 520. Uh, Professor Heyman will give, be giving a lecture, and I'll be giving a brief response, and then we'll be opening up into a discussion. So please come to that if you can. And also, the Jack Miller Center has told me to um, recommend an event that happens on Thursday the 18th over at Roosevelt University. Amity Schles, a uh, best-selling author and commentator, is going to give a lecture called Every Man's Constitution, question mark, the truth about the New Deal as told through its most important case. So again, that's over at Roosevelt University uh, on Thursday, sponsored by the Jack Miller Center. So all I have to do here is to introduce our moderator, who then introduced our three panelists. Our moderator uh, should be familiar to most people here, although I was joking <laughs> that maybe uh, we've forgotten about our, our dear colleague, Carolyn Shapiro, uh, my, my friend, sometimes co-author, who is currently taking a leave from teaching here to serve as Illinois Solicitor General. So Carolyn will take over from here, introduce our panelists, and then we'll be off. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Chris. Um, and it's really exciting to be here on this panel with these um, terrific and amazing women. Um, so I will briefly introduce them, starting at the far end and moving this way, and then they'll each speak for about 10 minutes. I might say a few things or ask a couple questions, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the room. Um, so at the far end of the table, we have Ronell Anderson-Jones, who's a professor of law and associate dean of academic affairs and research at Brigham Young University Clark School of Law. Um, Ms. Jones, uh, Professor Jones was a, uh, went to law school at Ohio State University, where she was first in her class, um, and clerked for Judge Fletcher on the Ninth Circuit and Justice um, Sandra Day O'Connor um, at the Supreme Court. Um, next to her, uh, we have um, Professor Sonia West, um, who teaches at the University of Georgia School of Law. Um, she clerked for uh, Judge Nelson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and Justice Stevens of the Supreme Court. And both of them actually worked as journalists before they went to law school. So they bring a perspective to this, um, to the questions we're going to be asking today um, that many of us don't have. Um, and next to me is Dahlia Lithwick, um, who I am particularly happy to see, um, who is a senior editor at Slate. And let me just say, if you are not reading Dahlia's uh, Supreme Court coverage at slate.com, you are so missing out. It is the best coverage out there. It is always interesting. It is often funny. Um, but it is extremely pointed. And um, at the end of every term, she hosts a breakfast club with uh, some other prominent thinkers um, on, on constitutional law. And they talk about the major cases of the term. Um, and I kind of save them all up and read them all at once when I'm going through withdrawal after they stop handing down cases. Um, Dahlia went to Stanford Law School, and she became a journalist after she went to law school. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to um, Professor Jones. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the Institute and to the uh, Jack Miller Center for um, bringing us here and um, hosting the event. Um, and thanks to Professor Schmidt um, for um, his organization of it. In his organizational emails, 
uh, Chris said that he really hoped that we would think about these two institutions, the media um, and um, the Supreme Court, and from both angles, sort of a little bit about Supreme Court jurisprudence about the press and a little bit about uh, the difficulties of uh, the press coverage of the Supreme Court. And um, Chris's wish is my command. And so um, I want to spend uh, my couple of minutes here thinking about the interaction between the two and um, sort of making an observation about that interrelationship. Um, my project um, might um, jokingly be titled, Do As I Say, Not As I Do, um, U.S. Supreme Court Justices and Press Access, uh, because it uh, focuses on what I think is um, a little bit of schizophrenia by um, the United States Supreme Court on this question of access by the press. Um, cold to its essence, I guess, my observation is this. The United States Supreme Court justices, um, in their role as articulators of legal doctrine in judicial opinions, are exceptionally, overwhelmingly press positive and um, sort of um, journalism access supportive. While these exact same justices, in their role as establishers of their own um, institutional media policies and their um, sort of their position as individual representatives of a public institution, are overwhelmingly press negative and access stingy. And I think that this dichotomy is a really, really fascinating one. I think it's worthy of exploration, both because of its ramifications for public education about the court, but also because of the sort of flow of information about our constitutional democracy. Um, for starters, in about the last 50 years, the United States Supreme Court has issued dozens and dozens of um, landmark decisions focused um, on the role of the press in our constitutional democracy. It has praised the media for its watchdog role. It has extolled the virtues of a free press in our society. It has called for public transparency and accountability and highlighted the ways in which a vigorous press and unfettered reporting really facilitate these important values. And although the trend is certainly not uniform, and some have um, recently suggested a waning trajectory, and uh, Professor West and I are sort of interested in thinking about it from an empirical standpoint to see if there are changes afoot. Um, on the whole, we can definitely say that a doctrinal snapshot of the modern Supreme Court from the Warren Court to present is exceptionally press friendly. Um, this is a court that, when its judicial robes are on, is pretty consistently siding with press freedom values, even when those values are at odds with other values that we ordinarily, as a society, wish to see protected quite vehemently, like the rights of criminal defendants and victims' rights and um, rights of privacy. And time and again, in cases all across the media law spectrum, we see them sort of offering up this homily, this um, speech about the press, and it's kind of um, one part hero worship and two part civics lesson, but it um, always contains a lot of the same components um, about um, the way that the press plays a unique role as a check on government the way that it plays an essential function in our democracy, a critical part of our discussion on public affairs, and that it is sort of the main tool that we have for the electorate keeping tabs um, on the government that it has elected. So in Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, for example, the court goes on at great length about the media's role as a surrogate for the people and calls it crucially important to public understanding of the law and criminal justice. In Cox Broadcasting versus Khan, it goes so far as to actually say uh, that without the press, none of us would ever be able to vote intelligently or really register any thoughtful opinions whatsoever about what's going on in our government. In uh, the famed New York Times versus Sullivan, the 50th anniversary of which we marked this year. Uh, the court really got to its watershed First Amendment holding by way of this formidable exposition on sort of the power and promise of the press in a free society. Uh, quoting no less than Madison, the opinion asserted that in every state in the union, the press has exerted a freedom in canvassing the merits and measures of public men of every description. On this footing, the freedom of the press has stood. On this foundation, it yet stands. And yet, in their own dealings with the press, right, when they are the public men and women of um, every description, the court and its justices have been accused, and I think uh, somewhat rightly, of being significantly more circumspect um, and sometimes, frankly, overtly hostile and creating sort of major barriers um, to the press, of press access to the institution and its work product, um, and really um, flatly declining to accommodate the needs of reporters who endeavor to cover the activities of the judicial branch and of its most prominent actors. 
Uh, the court is faulted regularly um, for being isolated and secluded and withdrawn. Um, and these criticisms have been logged at, uh, at the court both institutionally, sort of as a group, um, and individually uh, for the justice's unwillingness to allow or accommodate coverage of their own sort of out-of-court activities or speeches at educational events in which they participate. So institutionally, I think, um, the press is sort of grudgingly tolerated but not warmly welcomed and certainly not assisted in any way. At least some press policies at the Supreme Court arguably show a total indifference to the needs of the real, the real world needs of the media. Um, useful information is rarely provided and when it is, it's provided long after it would be valuable to anybody turning around um, uh, news on a modern deadline. Video coverage is flatly denied. Developments on the provision of audio happened in this halting, uneven fashion and ultimately landed on this very um, unfortunate policy in which audio is provided at the very end of the work week, right long after the news cycle has ultimately passed. Indeed, when the highest courts of other nations in the world were um, long past their experiments with video coverage and moving on to other modern social media technology, the justices of the United States Supreme Court were still debating whether to allow pens in the courtroom and sort of dragging their feet even over the development of a very simple plan for releasing same day written transcripts of oral arguments. Um, not a, uh, Just over a decade ago um, when I worked um, as a, a junior member of a team um, a, in a Supreme Court practice at a major um, US law firm, um, I was assigned pretty regularly to go to the Supreme Court arguments uh, that we were arguing, and my job was just to memorize a particular justice. I just had to sort of go in and be O'Connor and watch her and remember all the questions that she asked and all the answers that were given so that our client, whose case was being litigated before this court, could know what was asked and how it was answered uh, because we didn't have transcripts. Um, today, people who are major reporters for news organizations that are entirely online get no press credentials, even though some of these journalists, like the folks at SCOTUS blog or Dahlia at Slate, um, are the main source of Supreme Court news for huge audiences of lawyers and academics and laypeople. Um, hand downs of decisions from this court are um, sort of famine or feast, so we have no access at all to their major work product on important um, issues and then more than could possibly be digested uh, by any journalist um, or any would-be informed member of the public. And in contrast to the massive public information machines of the concomitant branches of government, um, think about regular um, interviews and briefings from um, Congress and the President, uh, the Supreme Court has a four-person public information office that does very little and essentially <laughs> takes big bundles of very complicated opinions and sort of lands them with a thump um, for them to be digested on a turnaround that is pretty short. So all told, institutionally, there are some fairly significant criticisms that are posed by press advocates regarding um, the court's refusal to adjust the way that it does business in seemingly minor ways that would have positive benefits for the flow of information about the court um, from the press to the public, and also that would at least arguably be more in keeping with the court's own grandiose statements about the virtues of press access. Um, individually, I'm finding in my research um, this dichotomy is just as stark, if not more so. There are numerous historical and current examples of justices, including those who authored or joined really strongly press-supportive court opinions, nevertheless demonstrating um, exceptional resistance to the media or you know, flatly prohibiting press coverage of their own public engagements or potentially relevant uh, aspects of their lives off the bench. And when they speak of the press um, in their public speeches, they speak of it uh, pretty consistently as untrustworthy and undeserving of access, which is inconsistent with what we see um, in their judicial opinion. So as a descriptive matter, I think there is a divide between what the justices as justices um, say about the role of the press in our society and what the justices as individual or institutional decision makers do when making their own um, decisions about press access. And I think it can't be that the explanation is just that all of this rights-promoting, access-encouraging language of these media law opinions are only speaking 
to the politically accountable uh, branches because a bunch of those opinions that I quoted at the beginning are opinions that speak like Richmond newspapers and Cox Broadcasting and Press Enterprise. They are all um, opinions about the judiciary and the importance of public awareness of that branch is going on. What's really happening here, I think, is that um, the justices understandably want to be viewed positively. They want to be viewed as competent and neutral and legitimate arbiters of significant disputes, which is no small value for us as a citizenry. Um, and they no doubt worry in this era of Daily Show and Colbert and YouTube um, that funny offhanded comments will be taken out of context. And you know, think about Justice Breyer's comment a couple of terms ago that right, people stuck things down as underpants um, in <laughs> elementary school. Right, People are going to hone in on that and they're going to take that clip and they're going to reshow it. Um, but that doesn't make the Supreme Court exceptional. It just makes them human. And I think it's inconsistent to intimate time and again in judicial opinions that the press can be trusted not to distort the news and that the occasional distortion is just the cost of doing business in a democracy. And then to hold out the possibility of that distortion of you as a reason for cutting off access. And in any event, our First Amendment doctrine suggests to us that more access should solve rather than add to distortion problems because further information would be more available to more people um, in making their judgments. In the end, I think it makes no clear sense why the very same press that is portrayed in heroic fashion in these opinions is portrayed in sort of villainous fashion when access to the court and the justices are at stake, or what makes them believe in this context alone that the media is not democracy serving and informative and helpful, but rather unfair and incompetent and untrustworthy. And I think that um, thinking really carefully about the really nuanced combinations of reasons for this divide and recognizing the very real constitutional and structural and psychological um, elements of these divides will put us in a better um, position to be having important, meaningful conversations about change. And those are conversations that I'm eager to promote and that I'm happy are being advanced by this panel today. So thanks very much for your time. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Happy Constitution Day. Uh, we have week. been talking, Constitution Week, we have been talking about how it's our new favorite holiday <laughs> where you exchange your Constitution Day presents and the Constitution fairy comes and leaves there. things for the children. So it's a wonderful thing and we're very happy. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to spend my time talking about what is probably the most discussed issue about the court and um, the press, for better or worse, and that is the issue of cameras at oral arguments. And there's been a lot of discussion about the pros and cons, about whether the justices should allow cameras into their oral arguments. I think there's some terrific policy art arguments to uh, think about transparency, the value of open government, if there's an educational value for people to see the oral arguments, if there might even be a constitutional right of access. Um, but what interests me about this debate um, that I've been thinking about recently is that um, in all fairness, the, the, the oral arguments at the Supreme Court are not secretive. They're extremely open. Uh, what the justices do when they have their oral arguments is nothing that's behind closed doors. They, they, they do this in front of a courtroom of 300 people. The press is there. They have their own section. They are being watched. They are being uh, scrutinized. Uh, they have transcripts of everything that is said that are released daily. They have audio so you can hear everything that's said and, and, and what gets a laugh and what doesn't or uh, um, who, who speaks and who doesn't and how they're answered. That's released um, weekly and, and up until at least recently they had they allowed live blogging of their opinion hand downs. That's now questionable what will happen now because of SCOTUS blog. But no one can accuse them of being secretive. No one can accuse them of saying we aren't allowing the public to have access. So what I've been wondering is why why then draw the line at cameras? Because draw the line, they have. They have drawn it uh, firmly. We don't allow cameras even purely for just archival, historical uh, purposes. They have drawn it forcefully. Uh, Justice Souter famously said, over my dead body. And then Chief Justice Roberts, at his confirmation when asked about it, said, Justice Souter said over his dead body, we all like Justice Souter, so they're not <laughs> having us uh, any sign. This uh, defies ideological 
lines. It is, defies generational lines. This is not an issue of just waiting out the older, uh, you know, techno fear phobia of, of the older justices. The newer justices, the younger justices, uh, are just as opposed to it. So m my question is, why is assuming and you know accepting that we already have all this other access? What is it about video that is so concerning to the justices? Why are they so scared at about it? So I wanted to go through and think about what the justices themselves are giving us as the main reasons for keeping video out. And there's a lot of evidence about this because pretty much every time a justice goes to a law school or gives some sort of speech and takes questions, this is one of the questions that they're asked. So we have lots of documentation out there about what their reasons are. And they really come down to three main reasons that we hear the justice is giving. The first is the concern about showboating or grandstanding, which I say is a concern about the participants themselves, the justices or the lawyers, that they're going to start acting up and putting on a, a dramatic display. This is something Justice um, uh, Kennedy has said that it's going to um, uh, give us this uh, insidious dynamic and that it's only human nature that the colleagues will start talking uh, to the camera. So there's this concern about how they might act. Uh, Justice Kagan has also mentioned this recently, that people might play up to the camera as one of her reasons. So my thought was, why don't we have this, what is it about video that's going to make people suddenly start acting up? Or is there any reason to think that they are? As I said, we already know that oral arguments, and if you've been there, it's, it's a huge show. Uh, there's, everyone comes in, there's a, the, what's called the three-minute line of people who couldn't get a seat, who constantly scroll through the back. They know, the justices are aware, everyone is keeping track how many times someone spoke, who spoke first, who got the laughs. No one's getting fooled that they are not getting watched or scrutinized every time they go up on uh, uh, the bench. So the question is, what would video change about having all those eyes uh, on them? And really, the most thing you can think is it would be just simply a bigger audience, that suddenly you're going to reach so many more people that you would change, potentially, your behavior. So my thought was, is there anything to that? And what could we look at to decide if that would be a problem? One thing would be to look at other courts that have allowed cameras in. Um, all of the 50 states allow cameras in in some form. Um, and uh, we have pilot programs in several of the appellate courts. The Canadian Supreme Court uh, has had cameras in uh, the courtroom for a couple of uh, decades. And just overwhelmingly, all those experiments with cameras in the courts have pointed to the fact that this is simply not a problem, that people very quickly forget about the cameras. It does not change their uh, behavior. Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin was in a conversation with Justice Ginsburg about this, and she said in her 21 years that at the time she was speaking, she could only think of one time that she thought a, a, an attorney was acting up for the cameras, and her solution, she said, was she told the lawyer to sit down. And that was the <laughs> end of that. Um, so um, another thought is about what happens at confirmation hearings. There's often this idea that, oh, we had these wonderful dignified confirmation hearings, then we let the cameras in and everything went to pot. And suddenly, they're just these big circuses. And we don't want that to happen in the courtroom. Uh, but actually, there's been some research on this. It's actually by one of my colleagues, Lori Ringhan, and a political scientist, Paul Collins. And they painstakingly went through the transcripts of every oral arguments of Supreme Court hearings. And what they uh, found was that from when television cameras came in, which was for Justice O'Connor's um, confirmation uh, hearings, that um, they did not um, change the basic dynamic of what happens in the confirmation hearings. They may have made them a bit longer. The senators talked a little bit more as they talked, but they did not make them more contentious. Uh, that actually said they were terribly contentious uh, Supreme Court confirmations before that. Felix Frankfurter apparently had quite the time. Um, Thurgood Marshall, Fortas, uh, both of Rehnquist's were uh, uh, very big deals. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be a concern uh, there. So the second thing the justices tell us is this concern about sound bites or taking things out of context. So this is a fear of what the media would do if they got uh, uh, um, this video. This is something Justice Scalia often says when he is asked about this. He says, it would be great if you could force everyone to sit down and watch it gavel to gavel, but they won't do that. They'll see 30 seconds here, 10 seconds here, and that's uh, not what I want to have happen. Um, again, so I ask myself, what, what, what about what we have currently? We have transcripts. We have uh, um, um, the audio. They can be taken out of context. They can be used in soundbite. Um, form, does video change anything about how that would work? Um, and the only thing I could think is, again, more people would see it, perhaps different people would see it. There's a concern that suddenly with these snip snippets uh, of video, it would reach 
a different kind of audience than what we're, um, we're getting uh, uh, before. And again, Justice Scalia uh, has said this in an, in an interview with C-SPAN. He says um, that different people, uh, um, the, he calls them the 15 second takeout people and the 30 second takeout people, uh, that those are the ones who are going to see this kind of, of, of uh, clip. Um, I think the question is, is that something that's a, that's a valid concern, that we might uh, see other types of um, um, viewers suddenly getting access to uh, the sound bite. And then finally, which is the third objection that the justices make, uh, which is really lately the one I've been hearing when I follow all this the most, is what I call sort of the miscomprehension argument. And this is a fear about what the public would do when they got access to uh, the video. And here the justices are expressing a concern that the public, if they saw a video of oral arguments, would be confused about what it was they were seeing. That they wouldn't understand where this oral argument came in the process. They wouldn't understand that the justices might be playing devil's advocate and they might be asking uh, the question even if it's not what they think. Or they wouldn't understand that the justices need to think about more than just the parties before them. They need to think more broadly. And that they wouldn't understand this, all of that's going on. This is uh, an argument Justice Breyer uh, has made on, on a number of uh, occasions that, um, that um, they aren't going to understand particularly that we have to think about the millions of other people and it might look like we're being mean to the person who is in front of us. Justice Sotomayor has recently made his argument. Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan are two of the many justices who, at confirmation hearings, express support for cameras. They get on the court some years go by, <laughs> manah, manah, and uh, they, um, um, suddenly they don't care about having justices or cameras anymore. And uh, Justice Sotomayor uh, said this, I don't think most viewers will take the time to actually delve into the briefs and the legal arguments and appreciate what the court is doing. They'll speculate, saying this judge favors this point. They won't understand the process and that we're playing devil's uh, advocate. So again, what do we have without video? Well, again, anyone can just read little bits of the transcript or hear a little bit of the audio. They might just read a little bit of the press coverage and not fully understand the issue. They might just hear some quote about Justice Breyer getting things put down his underwear in the locker room and not understand the argument. We still have that risk that they're not going to understand the case and they're not going to understand what oral argument is. Does video uh, change anything uh, about this? And again, I think uh, this is a concern about video having the ability to reach different people and more people, but particularly uh, different people, a, a group that seems somehow uh, less sophisticated. I, we're, we're comfortable, if you get your news by picking up the New York Times and reading Adam Liptak, uh, that you understand what oral argument is, but maybe there's this concern that if you see a video on YouTube or on The Daily Show that you don't understand where this is. They're not quite saying this, but it's the only thing that I can think of that explains the jump uh, of why video raises this concern when others uh, haven't. Um, and again, um, there's nothing really to think about how the justices act outside the courtroom um, or looking at other ways to think that these uh, concerns about video um, um, hold up. Um, things from uh, the confirmation hearings, Justice uh, Thomas in his autobiography actually praises, he has a line in his autobiography where he says, I thanked God for C-SPAN's gavel to gavel coverage of my confirmation hearings. He thought it allowed him to direct, talk directly to um, uh, the public. And, 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 that not, and bypass all of these issues. Um, ultimately, I'm, I, I find myself asking, what is their real fear? What is really going on here? Because I'm not sure any of these arguments really hold up, hold water compared to the access that they're already allowing. And all I can come up with really is a fear of the unknown. And sometimes this is expressed, that there's just a concern that we don't know what's going to happen if we allow cameras in, and that, that, and that they feel a need um, to, to, to protect this institution that they surely, clearly feel uh, greatly about. And, um, they, feel, they think better safe than sorry. Uh, why allow them in when we might open ourselves up to some risk? To which I would think, because I do s support having uh, cameras here, that while caution is a virtue, there's a point at which it becomes paralysis. And, and I do fear we are losing out on a lot of valuable information because of these unfounded fears about what video might do. Thank you. Uh, so I also want to say thank you uh, for having us. It, um, whenever the three of us get together and talk about this, I always am 
slightly thinking it's the Charlie's Angels of the First Amendment. You know, you know, I, I want to just say, hold it. Um, and none of you get that reference. <laughs> okay, well, 200 okay. years ago, there was a show. Um, so, so I want to a little bit amplify um, what Professor Anderson Jones said about uh, just this deep anxiety uh, that the court has about the press because, uh, and I obviously come to it from the perspective, not you know the perspective of a, of a First Amendment scholar, but from a practitioner uh, who gets that 300-page opinion dumped on my desk with four seconds to tweet it, uh, and the expectation that I'm going to tweet it in four seconds. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, how the relationship between the, the court and the media has changed just in the short time, you know, 15 years that I've been covering it. And that sounds like a long time, I'm sure, but like I'm still, by 200 years, the youngest person covering uh, <laughs> the court. Um, and it's changed, I think it's become much more uh, uh, oppositional and fractious, and I think, so I, I would add to uh, Professor West's uh, terrific analysis, I think increasingly the justices are, are quite afraid of their safety and their security and their privacy. And um, it's gotten, I think, much worse, uh, in addition to her three reasons, uh, they really feel that they're under assault in a way that they didn't used to be. I wanna add that. Uh, part of the story, but I, I think I want to just go back and say there's always been uh, a tense relationship between uh, the press and the court, and that's because, uh, as is the case in all dysfunctional relationships, when you desperately need each other and loathe each other at the same time, <laughs> you've got kind of a baked-in problem, and the press needs the court. We need access to the court. We need to be credentialed by them. We cannot walk in and cover the court the way we can cover other branches of government, so we need them. We need to get interviews. Interviews. We need to tell stories, uh, and we hate them because they withhold all that. The court, by the same token, needs the press, has always needed the press, right? And even in the beginning era of the Supreme Court, they would pay to, to print uh, opinions themselves because people need to know what the court is doing. And so the court needs us to disseminate uh, opinions because they know nobody is reading 300 pages and 2,000 footnotes. So we need each other. But we don't like working in tandem and we don't believe uh, that we should have to help each other and it's a huge problem. So I think just as all codependent relationships eventually kind of run aground, we are getting into a very tense situation, I think, with the advent of the new uh, media. There's one other thing I think just needs to say as a, a sort of <coughs> over, over looking this entire problem, which is there's one story that the court wants to have told about the court, and I think uh, Ronell uh, flicked at this. The only story that they want to appear in everything that any of us write is that an oracular and fair Supreme Court that doesn't make mistakes today issued a perfect opinion in X. <laughs> and that is the story, if we wrote that story every day, they would help us to write it. The story they really hate is anything political or ideological or personal or that in any way suggests, uh, as Sonia said, that they are humans and interesting. And so I think that the fact that we don't write an oracular and perfect Supreme Court yet again today did nothing important other than be oracular and correct uh, is, is really a profound problem for them. Uh, and unfortunately, we work for editors who prefer the other story, which is Republican appointed uh, conservative justices did X, Democrat appointed liberal justices did Y. This is because they're purely political animals and this is the story that our editors and our readers want to hear. So you can sort of see how that's going to become a problematic uh, relationship. Just briefly, I want to tell you how the advent of the new media has changed and I think worsened that tension. Uh, we used to have a day to write a story. We now have about 12 minutes before we're supposed to tweet it and uh, we have to post something. If a story is handed, if a opinion is handed down at 10, we are supposed to, all of us, not just, just the wires, all of us are meant to have a full and thoughtful analysis up by noon. So that's, that's the tension that we operate under and that's the reason that the ACA uh, decision was misreported for the first few minutes. Uh, the court does not do anything to help us 
get that right because they feel if we get it wrong, that's on us. There's a famous wonderful apocryphal story where Linda Greenhouse, then the dean of the press corps, went to then Chief Justice Rehnquist and said, instead of handing down three huge opinions on one day, which we cannot possibly read and report correctly for tomorrow's paper, I wonder if you couldn't spread it out over the last couple of weeks of June so we could get it right. And Chief Justice Rehnquist said, why don't you just report on some of it today? and the rest of it tomorrow, as though we could all just collude and agree that this isn't news today, but maybe tomorrow it is. Just a, a complete sort of 18th century understanding of how the media work. Um, you know, there's been huge changes in the size of the press corps, even in the time that I've been there. It's shrunk by about half. Uh, nobody, nobody wants to pay for a dedicated U.S. Supreme Court reporter. So we have fewer people uh, covering the court uh, as the court hands down opinions that have gone from 20 pages to 40 pages to 160 pages in a very, very short time. So we have fewer people to do uh, really, really insanely complicated work of digesting and uh, explaining opinions. And we have to do this with neither video nor audio, which uh, was awesome in the 1850s. But really now, we need to have access to those things, and, and we don't. Again, I think every attempted conversation with the court to say there are things one could do uh, in Canada, they have a room where they put all the reporters with all the opinions two hours before the hand down time. They take away your Blackberry, you read the opinion, and at 10 a.m., when the hand down happens, you've read it. There are things that can be done, and state courts have done them. The U.S. Supreme Court truly feels that if we get it wrong, that's our problem. And that may be our problem, uh, but it's, it's really, really quite difficult. And uh, the story I tell, because I feel like it so illuminates how this goes, is when the healthcare cases were handed down uh, two years ago, reporters had to choose between being in the, in the uh, ceremonial courtroom where you could watch the hand down and write longhand but not leave, in which case by the time all the dissents were read, it was three days later and the news cycle had ended, you could sit in a room where you could hear the audio but not type so that if you thought you had figured out what had happened, you could certainly leave and write your story, but if you got it wrong, oh well. Or you could be in a room where you could neither see nor hear, but you could read, and I really feel it's like those three monkeys, like they hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and the idea that you know, news, serious news uh, outlets had to figure out in which way they wanted their hands tied behind their back to report the biggest legal story of the decade is really, I think, quite problematic. The other thing that I uh, want to say is that in the face of a very dramatically changing news media, uh, the court insists that nothing has changed. And so it's not simply that we don't get access to audio, that we only recently had transcripts where it didn't say the court where it said the name of the justice asking the question because remember, oracular great justices don't need to be named. Uh, but I think that as they make these tiny incremental changes and say, you know, now we're going to do same day transcripts, uh, the whole world has changed exponentially. And so justices really do, and this goes to what Ronell was saying, insist that their public speeches, that when they go out places in the world, uh, nothing about that is interesting or important or newsworthy. Uh, they insist that if they go to partisan political events and someone captures them in a photograph, that that's not news. And they insist that their relationships and who they hang out with and what they do is also uh, not publicly interesting news. And that's a problem in the era of the citizen journalist, where all you need to do is say, there you are, Justice Alito, and he's uh, on the cover of a magazine. All you need to do is go to Justice Thomas's absolutely off-the-record speech at University of Virginia four years ago, where it is no press was allowed and verbatim reported the next day in Politico. So there are no private spaces anymore. There is no off the record anymore. For a little time, there was some magical thinking where the justices thought, if I fly to Europe and give a speech, <laughs> no one will know that it happened. And so they would fly to Europe and say crazy things. And one reporter would write it down. There would be no transcript of the speech. I think now they've figured out that in Europe there are, in fact, reporters. So there's a little bit less of that. But they just have this very, very magical thinking that the press is not going to intrude on their lives. 
And I just want to close by saying that as the media has gotten very, very intrusive in ways that uh, really frighten them, uh, and I think as they have disallowed interviews and, and access and credentialing and all the things that we need to do to do our jobs, I think that the real reaction that I see and the one that scares me, and this is the difference I think between print journalism and online journalism, is the justices start to write about online, any online uh, activity uh, as a form of threat and that they are experiencing uh, online journalism, any online commentary, as inherently threatening and violative of their privacy. And so just to loop back to the second question, which is how it's affecting the doctrine, uh, there's a, a line of cases that are very, very disturbing to me as an online journalist, where the justices say things about modern technology, the internet, uh, that make me think that it is always in their view uh, expressed as a personal threat and, and dangerous to them. So I just want to read you, and Justice Alito has written of this, Justice Breyer has written of, of this. Uh, Justice, uh, I'm just going to read you Justice Thomas because I think it's emblematic of this view. Justice Thomas writes, the state of technology today creates some probability that signers of any referendum will be subject to threats, harassment, reprisals, uh, if any of their personal information is disclosed. The uh, advent of the internet enables rapid dissemination of information need needed to threaten or harass any uh, referendum signer. So there's a feeling that once you're out on the internet, it's different from the rest of the world. People can just Google you, figure out where your kids go to school, find your license plate, and come get ya. And at one level, that's true. And certainly, I think the justices, when they say, because one of the other reasons they testify that they don't want cameras, is they feel very unsafe. But a lot of this language came about at the same time that the court decided to lock the front doors. And it seems to me that this feeling of being under assault, under, a sie under siege, and a feeling that there's no private spaces anymore, that there's no regard for uh, you know, some world in which they can do what they want to do without scrutiny, has started to leach into the way they think about the media. And I think that that's a conversation that really does need to happen, because I think if the justices are experiencing the media, but particularly the new media, and let me just add, I'm one of two credentialed new media people, and we didn't invent the internet yesterday. Uh, but if they are experiencing it, as personally assaultive and threatening, and that's something we really, I think, need to remedy quite quickly. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for those very interesting and um, thought-provoking presentations. And I'm gonna um, start with one question, um, and I know that we have at least one person here who's gonna disagree with much of what has been said about cameras. Um, I actually am going to have to try to play devil's advocate a little bit since I largely agree with the, the arguments in favor of transparency, but um, following up a little bit on what, on what Dahlia said, I think one thing that the justices may worry about is a slippery slope. And the slippery slope is not just cameras in the courtroom, but once we start saying, well, they're a public institution and we should see how they do their work, doesn't that suggest we should be in the conference room with them? Doesn't that suggest we should be reading the drafts of their opinions? And, um, and maybe we should. Um, so I'm curious what your response to that would be. Um, well, that's why I framed mine as looking at the access that they already allowed and trying to see what the you know, sort of difference was between what they allow. So they don't allow access to their drafts and to their uh, conference discussions, and you know, I think for good reasons. And I think a lot of people would think for good reasons, but they do allow all this public access to oral arguments. And so that's where I have trouble, is making the leap um, exactly what the difference is with, with, with video cameras. Yeah, I think the question of the anonymity of the justices is a really interesting one. Um, the year that I clerked at the court, uh, Justice uh, David Souter was uh, brutally attacked while out jogging next to the Potomac. And um, this just sort of goes to show the way that Supreme Court law clerks think. Like um, internally, when that news came to us the day that it happened, all of us instantly jumped to the conclusion that someone had been angry that this Republican appointee had become sort of liberal on the court or that they were upset about this opinion that had been handed down a couple of weeks earlier. Or right, we came up with all of these um, attacks on Justice Souter um, explanations. And then as it played out, the answer was that he was um, you know, grabbed by a group of 
thugs who were committing a random crime against what they thought was sort of an elderly man jogging along the Potomac, right, an easy looking victim. They didn't, they had no idea that they were attacking a justice of the United States Supreme Court, which right, you, you would not, um, you know, attack the president and not know that you had done so, or, um, you know, the Speaker of the House, it's likely that you're going to know, um, that the, but that's the sort of the level of anonymity that these people enjoy. There's actually a really a funny story about Chief Justice Rehnquist who had a bad back, um, for many, many years and used to like to um, walk and talk to his clerks. So they would circle the, um, the block outside the Supreme Court building while talking about cases. And um, his law clerks all have stories of people stopping them and like asking for directions to the Supreme Court or asking who, a guy they did not know was the Chief Justice of the United States to you know, take a photo of them um, you know, in front of the Supreme Court building. And that you know the clerk will just sort of smirk to know that this is. And I think they treasure that anonymity. And I think that they're, um, one of the reasons that they treasure that anonymity is um, a good reason, a democracy serving reason, which is that it isn't about them, right, um, in a way that um, the presidency and um, uh, the members of Congress are about them. That is, we chose them um, and we can remove them. And there is something different about this, right, um, sort of least dangerous branch that we want to keep different. We want to think really, that, that's what makes these debates so, so hard, is that there is something really precious about um, the otherness of the judiciary that makes debates about cameras and debates about um, transparency really, really tricky. And um, I think the problem is uh, that the sort of difference, the, the difference between them and the other branches is this big, and the difference in um, sort of our ability to learn about them is this big. And so part of it is sort of figuring out that gap, figuring out um, what sorts of things really we need to preserve in order to preserve the judiciary as it serves us in our democracy that we don't ever want to sort of um, give up. Uh, um, and the uh, pieces on which they could give a little in order to really, really enhance um, sort of our American democracy, the flow of information. Um, Justice O'Connor talks about this all the time post-retirement. It's her, it's like, it's her mission um, to talk about civic um, engagement and to talk about civic education and how little, right, she's always quoting this study about how people can name all of the seven dwarves and they can't name a single justice of the United States Supreme Court, right, really staggering lapses in public education. And some piece of that, I have to believe, is tied to um, a lack of accommodation of the press. And if I could just briefly add, I mean, I think that the court has already constructed the line between public and private, and oral argument, like it or not, is public. You know, it's <coughs> not like asking to see private papers. Right. There are really good policy reasons for that, some of which uh, Ronell uh, alluded to, but I, I think that once you've said that oral argument is a public event, and before the ACA ca cases, to have people standing in line for three days, or what more? accurately happened was people paying other people uh, to stand in line for three days to access, you know, one of a handful of seats. That shows me that uh, this place that is meant to be a public space is a private space, and I really do think the presumption that the court gets to determine what are their private acts and what are their public acts does not make sense in a democracy. We have to presume that public spaces are public spaces uh, because the justices, I think, would very happily do oral argument with paper bags over their heads. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. Yampi? Well, <laughs>
I can go briefly. I mean, I think what I would say is that you still have that now. It just happens when the justices have a book to sell, um, you know, and then you just let go down this rabbit hole of infinite, you know, suddenly they're on Sesame Street and wait, wait, don't tell me. And, you know, nothing is too lowbrow uh, once you're trying to hawk a book. And so, I, you know, I, I think that we have to be really, really careful because I think that, you know, if that's the argument, then I think that we have to, you know, hold the justices to that. But this feeling like there is a cult of personality around Sonia Sotomayor right now, and she throws out opening pitches at ball games, and she goes to Costco, and you know, she and Hillary hug, <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's really, and uh, you know, I, I actually think, on balance, that's a good and humanizing and interesting thing. But I think that you can't sort of, on this issue, let the justices pick and choose when they want the cult of personality and when they don't. And I, I think we were just saying, I think Sotomayor is a really interesting example of somebody who wants to be. Her Heard outside of the courtroom and is trying to educate the public about what justices do and what she does and what her story is. Uh, and the only other thing I would say, and this goes to your point, not to mine, but um, you know, whenever I make a plea for more transparency and openness, and then once a year you see these studies of who are the most loved and hated justices. Uh, now, Bearing in mind that nobody knows who any of them are, and everybody, everybody dopey and sneezy are yeah, my favorite. Yeah, no, everybody, everybody. Thurgood Marshall has been winning this study for years after he died. Still, the favorite sitting justice. But interestingly, the ones that the public uh, generally hate the most are the most exposed justices. So there is this problem where the public wants this sort of reified, you know, oracular justice and they get very nervous when their justices are on wait, wait, don't tell me. So, so that sort of goes to your point, but I think my answer to that is probably they are human and they are, uh, you know, you ch choosing to be public in some settings. Uh, so I just don't know that their ability to pick and choose when they're shown off as a cult of personality to their best advantage and uh, when they're not is, is entirely fair. Yeah, and I, I think um, I think Sotomayor is a really interesting case study because, uh, well, I guess all of them who have done this flip in um, what they've said at confirmation about their preference about cameras and then what they say as justices about their position on cameras is really, really interesting to me um, because what it tells us is that either they lacked some insight into what it, um, what, how important it was to forbid the camera until getting there. Um, or I think there is the possibility that they became so um, disgruntled with the camera coverage of the confirmation proceeding. I actually think there's the, the chance that the confirmation proceeding itself is what pushed them over the edge where they sort of just, um, I was, you know, my family and I were abused on national television for all this time and therefore, um, the question that you asked me at the beginning of the confirmation proceeding, which is, how do you feel about cameras? I feel cool about them. Um, if you ask me it, even the day after the confirmation proceeding, they maybe don't. I think there might be something to the sort of rigor um, and the angst that is created by that process that might have pushed them um, in that direction. And it, it's interesting because, right, Sotomayor is a person who, um, at her confirmation proceeding, said that she thought that cameras in the courtroom would be an acceptable proposition. Um, post um, time on the bench, said that they would not be, and then post that time, appeared on all manner of television, <laughs> right, um, and radio, and um, uh, all sorts of interviews um, in a way that um, maybe draws a line between cameras at oral argument and cameras on her in her own personal choice. But I think those are. Um, angles that are worth exploring about sort of, certainly if our concern is um, the dignity and non-personalization of them, it smacks against it, but also if our concern is safety or security or anonymity, it strikes against that, right? If you're of your own accord going on The Daily Show, then um, you have um, you have abandoned any <laughs> effort to remain anonymous. Um, David Souter didn't, right? So he got to make his own choices. Um, but Sonia Sotomayor and Justice O'Connor and, um, and Clarence Thomas, right? Um, each of them um, appeared on lots and lots of news programs with a really wide viewership. Um, and certainly, um, no one f forced them to do so. Um. I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm glad to see you here. I've read your work, and you make a lot of very thoughtful um, comments. And, but you brought up, you sort of referenced Judge Ito for most of the people in the 
courtroom <laughs> that you don't remember, when but this is from the, the O.J. Simpson, which was really one of the turning points against cameras in courtrooms because we had, you know, obviously O.J. Simpson was on trial for double murder, and they allowed cameras in the courtroom, and it was the whole thing was just a mess, right? And it was all everyone, everyone watched this thing and said, "What a circus!" And then many, many, many people thought he was very, very, very guilty, and he gets acquitted. And there was a very strong reaction to that. You know, there was a very complicated, strong reaction to that. But a lot of people pointed their fingers at the cameras and said that allowed this, this trial to get completely out of control. I've just never been quite so convinced that it was the camera. I mean, Judge Ito maybe made some mistakes and deserved some blame or whatever, but I always think what would have happened after that in the aftermath of that if there hadn't been those cameras in there where all the people who thought he was very, very guilty and got away didn't, wasn't, wasn't able to see how amazingly good his defense attorney was. If it doesn't fit, you can't, you must acquit. Like, it was so good. This was really good lawyering and how on the outer, other side, not so great the prosecution was, <laughs> and how horrible, I mean, one of their main witnesses was this cop, uh, Furman, what was his name? Mark he was Mark Furman. He was he was hor horrible, right? He was terrible. I mean, he, and you had to see it on the screen. You had to see how shifty he looked, and you're like, and how awful. And you're like, he's lying. He's racist. Like whatever. I'm not sure that would have come through in a press report. I'm not sure that would have come through if you didn't have, if you just read a a, a transcript. So I've always thought the the, the reaction to the, that trial might have been even worse. Um, and thought if we hadn't been able to see exactly what had uh, transpired. But nonetheless, it was sort of it was really a turning point against. And I practiced in uh, Los Angeles uh, before I started teaching for, and did a lot. And a lot of what we tried to do uh, was to, because in California, uh, the, the rule was it was up to the judge. Personally, you could make a, a, an application. We would like to have a video, and the judge could decide you know, in each individual case. And so a lot of our practice was trying and failing to get cameras into <laughs> to courtrooms. You know, we tried and failed to get them into every sort of big uh, thing. And you know, the Michael Jackson case was there, and they failed. So what did we get? We got the E! Entertainment Network hired actors and to, who looked like Michael Jackson and people and gave them the transcript and acted it all out for it. But it, was, it became extremely difficult uh, following that to ever get a camera into a courtroom uh, for some kind of trial, um, and a lot of it's because of, 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 of that particular uh, instance. I'm just going to chime in quickly, um, moderator's prerogative, um, and say I think that there is a, I agree with you that there's a lot of concern about the cult of personality, but I think increasingly the justices are kind of embracing the cult of personality, and there's this recent phenomenon of justices writing memoirs, um, which is all about who they are um, as, as people. Just last week, I went to hear Justice Ginsburg speak at the Chicago Bar Association, and it was a fabulous event, and it was really interesting. Just Judge uh, Williams from the Seventh Circuit sort of had a conversation with her, um, but it was, it had, there was a prepared PowerPoint, clearly not just for this occasion, and it was all about Justice Ginsburg. I mean, at the very end, there was some stuff about law, <laughs> but <laughs> mostly it was about Justice Ginsburg, who has a great story. I mean, it was terrific and inspiring, but um, it was definitely not about anonymity. Um, did you have your hand up, Kathy? I, I, I did. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm I mean, and that's been the, you know, that's what they've said. I mean, they've just said, you know, you want to get it wrong, you get it wrong. Um, Tom Goldstein tried to prove empirically 
um, that after the ACA was misreported for, what, eight minutes until they corrected it, that there was huge market fluctuations. And like, it's, it's actually, there weren't. You know, there are no tangible, uh, you know, uh, there are no tangible uh, effects. And, and so what the court says, we didn't look bad, you looked bad. Uh, I don't know that that's true. I think we looked equally bad. In my view, I think the press uh, looked like they got it wrong, and I think that the court looked bad, and I think that all those poor Congress people who were shown whooping it up in their office, <laughs> thinking that Obamacare had been struck down and then not struck down, also looked bad. So we were equal opportunity and chumps. For those, for those seven minutes, um, the President of the United States was misinformed right. because he was watching CNN and Fox News who had that had tickers that were, because, okay. right, so. <laughs> They should be, no one should have said anything yet. Right. That's yeah. right. Read the whole thing first. Well, that, yeah, yeah, I mean, but I just think that, that this is sort of shutting the barn door on media long, long after media has run out. I mean, it, I, you're right. You know, we should have non-stupid media. Stipulate. <laughs> but um, it doesn't work that way. And, and I think, you know, and, and what, what you're asking brings up a really interesting question, which we haven't addressed, but that is, you know, so, so the Supreme Court website crashed. And the millions of people who were refreshing trying to figure out what happened in the healthcare cases went to SCOTUS blog. So there were millions of people on SCOTUS blog, which is now kind of the Supreme Court website, except it's kind of operated by people who try cases there. So it's incredible, you know, with advertising. So it's just incredible. Into the vacuum, it is not as though nothing has rushed. What is rushed is something that is almost an arm of the court, except that they can't get credentials. <laughs> so I just think, you know, this doesn't neatly resolve, it, what happens is it gets resolved with workarounds that I think in some ways resolve, uh, create more problems uh, than they solve. And I think SCOTUS blog, I mean, I haven't seen really good uh, empirical work on whether people think SCOTUS blog is run by them. Actually, there was a whole thing this there was summer. A t there was a, an, a series of tweets um, this past summer at the end of the term in June in which um, SCOTUS blog was being um, uh, just like ridiculed and chastised and um, um, debased by um, people who follow them uh, on Twitter who were plainly operating under the false assumption that they were the official blog of the Supreme Court of the United States and they were sort of like, don't shoot the messenger, we're, yeah, just, yeah. we're actually not Ooh, SCOTUS Hobby at Lobby, all. we did whatever. Like, we hate that opinion and Tommy Goldstein is sort of like, I didn't Write it or have any hand in it. I'm just sort of passing it along. Um, but people are um, looking for information when the hand down happens. I mean, there are a bunch of sort of really weird aspects of this. For example, um, I actually went to the Supreme Court as a clerk assuming that the justices all signed off on the syllabus, that sort of summary of the opinion that happens at the beginning. And it was only sort of a month into my clerkship that I discovered I'm sort of authoring, you know, um, the first opinion and taking it over and right, working with um, as a go-between between my justice and uh, the people who are ultimately going to get it into press. And I realized we have no hand in this and we don't put our, like, the justice doesn't sign off on it and doesn't see it and none of them do. It's just some sort of clerical worker, right, um, who's um, reading over the opinion and writing it up. And I was mortified to discover this, right, even though there is this the little statement in Westlaw that you always see, right, um, this is um, not any sort of official. Um, and one wonders why we couldn't, for example, as a minor step, have a syllabus that um, the justices could say, we agree that that is an accurate executive summary of the <laughs> opinion that felt like it at a minimum has like some piece of official um, s synopsis of what has happened in the 120 pages to come. That seems to me like a very small step towards right the sort of stopping of the you know the running of the interns of people dashing out there's all that horrible horrible footage of bush versus gore where you know in the dark of night these poor you know little interns right, are running out with pieces of paper it. and they're reading things that don't mean anything to them and sort of dan uh, abrams that's right, just hair just flopping around paper. And, the sheets flying. Yeah. and it is it's um it's unseemly uh, to cover <laughs> the united states supreme court in that way um, but it's also, the court has handed down an opinion and it, it would seem like they should have an interest in the accurate reporting of that opinion. And it, it, 
I understand, I think that the reason that they don't sign off on the syllabus is that they had a hard enough time in 120 pages, right, um, saying what the holding was, or they don't want to sort of pin down what the actual holding was. They want you to have to read the tea leaves um, in the sort of careful, nuanced dance that has already come down. Uh, but there are lines from the opinion that we can certainly agree are in the in the opinion, right? I mean, I could write a really accurate syllabus for the ACA case that would, in one page, have told everyone um, Roberts believed it not sustainable constitutionally under this uh, provision in the Constitution and sustainable under this provision, and that could have been a rip and read that would have been an accurate reflection to the American people of what had happened, and that seems to me. Um, some of these baby steps, right? I mean, we don't have to sort of blow down the doors and bring in all the cameras and do everything, but there are um, really minor steps that the court has um, not been willing to even consider, and I find, I find that perplexing. I think part of the answer, too, goes to what Ronell was uh, talking about to begin with, which is the court talks about how the press does play this important constitutional function of informing the public, and that it's good for the public to be informed, and we want them to be informed about government, and then they go, and, uh, and good things happen, when, and, then, and the press is this important, maybe not the only, but this important part of that of that process, and then, and then and they say all this, and then they turn around and say, that's your problem, we don't care, and so the question is, do they have any of the responsibility of helping the public from which they are, for whom they are writing these opinions, get the information that are that, or, or is that really? Are they able to just, you know, talk to the hand about it and and and, and push it all off on, onto the press? Um, Tony Morrow has a story about Je Chief Justice Rehnquist saying to him at a Christmas party, um, "Well, you know, unlike the other branches of government, we don't need the press." We don't really need you. Yeah. 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 Tony Morrow is one of the deans of the Supreme Court press corps. So, any and more his questions? Birthday is today. Today is his birthday. Happy birthday, birthday Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> um, in the back. My understanding is it's unclear the extent to which Congress could mm -hmm. uh, require them to have cameras. Um, I think if we actually got to that point, perhaps it might be, perhaps it might be a trigger for for the justice to say we should at least consider. You know, one thing they haven't done is the justices haven't even. They talk, like I said, everything I took was from, you know, little speeches they give here and there where law students ask them this question. They get asked about it frequently, but there's never been any kind of. Cons, you know, consider dialogue with them or an opinion. They, this, you know, C-SPAN files requests all the time, and they get a letter saying, "Sorry, no." And 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 that's you know about as far as it um, um, goes. It would be nice to even sort of have them do kind of what they do, give us a reasoned opinion about what exactly uh, the problems are. So it might at least push push it to that point. But or else we could we could really have an issue about who gets the final, who's the decider Yeah, that would about be an cameras. interesting it would constitutional be interesting. crisis, it would right? Be mm -hmm. when, when they shut the lights off, <laughs> we'll know. Stop sending won. paychecks. Yeah, we'll know. One other thing, just unrelated, but but important, is that a lot, we talked a lot about cameras and very little about audio, but, you know, the court has the capacity to do same-day audio, and, and in big cases, they have done same-day audio, and so for folks who are not persuaded by the video arguments, I think there's a whole host of... of far more difficult questions about why the court has taken the position that, you know, initially we'll give you same-day audio, but only in the big cases, but then we'll take away same-day audio for several years because we felt a little hinky, and then we're going to give it to you on Friday at 5 where, you know, news goes to die. And, and so it just seems to me that, um, you know, in addition to all this, even if you accept Sonia's list of concerns, there, really, I, there is no valid concern. Uh, around the audio question, and yet the court has taken the posture that that. Took or it. even live streaming of audio, so that when you know the Hobby Lobby decision is going on, instead of sitting there on Twitter hoping maybe some people will tweet this and that about what's going on, you could you could listen. And since we're already doing the audio, could you listen live? Which Justice Breyer recently was asked about, you know, what about live streaming audio? To which he he responded, "You mean put it on the radio?" <laughs> which makes you think <laughs> on the Twitter. He calls on, it the, on the Twitter. On the Twitter. So, on the Twitter but, is what he called it. You know, so. So there are other baby steps. We don't have to all focus on, on cameras. I actually thought that the um, trajectory of the audio policy was one of um, the most disappointing trajectories in all of this because um, the, 
the technology is plainly available, and it's plainly available for them to utilize in a totally neutral way, which is we record the whole thing, and at the end of the day, we hand it over to you, right, in a digital file that's obviously just e so, so easy to make and be available. And instead of just doing that, they said, no, we, we won't do that. Oh, but this, this opinion matters um, a great deal, and you know, Nina Totenberg's going to want it, or you know, whatever the reason is. And there's a, there's a great deal of interest in this, or it's important, and therefore we will do it. And I find it um, really unsettling that there was a period of time in which the justices were deciding that some of their opinions were more important than other of their opinions, right? Because um, to the litigants involved, every opinion is super important, and to the, um, um, the segment of the American population that's affected um, far beyond the individual litigants in any given case, all of the opinions are by definition important. It's the end, it's the end of the line legally, and those are all important opinions. So I'm grateful actually that we at least moved from that sort of discretionary mm -hmm. model that I found really unbecoming. But it seemed to me that when they, when they announced that they were going to move from that discretionary model, I was positive, having demonstrated that the end of the day was easy for them to produce, that they would go to that and to sort of go to this uh, Friday at 5 model was in some respects just an absolute slap to the media. This suggestion that, yes, yes, we will give it to you because you know we can, um, but we know that this will be a time that will sort of bury it. And, um, and I find that overly antagonistic um, in a way that, um, that doesn't seem to serve a free flow of information about the court. We have time for one more question right there. Yeah, so, um, I, so I think as a global matter, one thing that we can say, I mean, I've heard actually a lot of dialogue about um, the Canadian system, right, that has been mentioned a couple of times here of um, sort of gavel to gavel uh, coverage. It was sort of a big deal at the moment it happened, and then very quickly it turned out that really only nerds actually watch it, right? <laughs> it isn't like people are sort of tuned in, um, nobody really cares about it, and actually people, um, the media rarely even snippet it. They just, um, they don't find it all that useful, and it's, um, it's available to people who are interested in real time, but otherwise not that important. And I think that that has largely proven to be the case in um, the federal courts and state courts that have experimented with, um, with camera coverage. Um, I didn't, I guess um, people didn't, when I was clerking at the Ninth Circuit, people didn't talk about the media as often um, as uh, it got talked about at the Supreme Court, in part because um, the decisions that were being made by the Ninth Circuit were only affecting a small, and they were on their way. <laughs> um, virtually every one of them uh, were on their way to the Supreme Court afterwards. <laughs> um, but, um, but I do think uh, th that there was a different, um, attitude in the building um, in the courthouse when I when I clerked at the Ninth Circuit in terms of press coverage. It was sort of expected and understood and it was going to happen and I think there was less angst about it. Um, yeah, there's no, oh, sorry. No, no, yeah. there's no doubt there's far more eyes on the Supreme Court and that you do have, even if it's shrinking, a, a dedicated press corps in the way you didn't have it on the Court of right. Appeals and, and you know, th that's not, that's, that's very clear and there's you're reading what they're saying and you're following it. But in the courts of appeals, there are some, the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, I know, I don't know which one others have um, cameras for oral arguments. And every once in a while you get a high profile case, uh, some of the same sex marriage cases right. went to the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit has uh, big cases. And you know, they, there's the, the cameras are there and there's, uh, there's press interest and uh, I don't know, this guy, this guy doesn't seem to fall, but, <laughs> but it's clear it's a more, it's a more, it's a rare thing for the, the eyes to turn. I, I um, you know, I always commend to people that when the U.S. Supreme Court unplugged the Prop 8 trial, right, and right. there was this per curiam order that comes out of the Supreme Court that very much reads like the Thomas quote I just gave, where the court says, oh, oh, you know, we can't, and there was a pilot program, and Judge Kaczynski, chief judge of the Ninth Circuit, had signed off on it. There was no reason not to go forward uh, with, with the um, televising of Prop 8. And the, the two arguments were advanced. One was the safety argument, right? Witnesses are going to be threatened and harassed. And, you know, once you throw it up on, on uh, video, you know, cats and dogs sleeping together, life as we know it, you know, <laughs> terrible things will happen. But then this really, really amazing argument where, where the court with a straight face says, this is too important. 
uh, let's do it with something that's really not important. And I thought, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the argument. I mean, we should, we should only, and this was at the time when the court was releasing same day right, audio, inside out, only yeah. of the important cases, but then they turned to, to the Prop 8 case and they say, let's try this with some like ERISA matter, you know, where nobody's <laughs> sweating it. Watching. And it was just such a, I thought it was, again, you know, in the, in the same way that Renal is talking about the audio policy, just in terms of like a Rorschach test of what the court's anxieties are. You read that per curiam opinion, uh, the court sort of mapping real concern about very, very odd things onto a pilot project that had already been approved in, you know, what was and this also goes to your point, would have been an amazing thing for America to watch. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists again and thank all of you for coming. Thank you.